Okay. Uh, good morning. Welcome. My name is Andy Cutchins. I'm director of the Russia and Eurasia program here, and it's a great pleasure to be uh, uh, chairing this panel and to be involved in this in this conference. You know, I'm at a at a stage in life where uh, 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 now in my mid 50s, where one sort of reviews, uh, sort of thinks and thinks about success or failure. When I was younger and I was training as a Sovietologist, and people would ask me what my job was, I would say, "Well, I'm uh, tr uh, training to save the world from Armageddon." And so every day I could clearly, I clearly identify success or failure is that I was still alive. As I got a little bit older, and now as I look back at things, what has been, the, what has been sort of the common theme throughout my career, and it's been trying to build uh, mutual understanding and cooperation between the Soviet Union and then the Russian Federation and the United States of America. And I'm afraid, while I've been pretty successful on, on saving the world from Armageddon, I haven't done so well on that, uh, on that second task. But uh, as the discussion suggested, I think on the first panel, uh, we do believe there is a lot, of, a lot of area for cooperation here on the set of issues around the Arctic uh, between, our, between our two countries. I'd like to express uh, my thanks uh, to, uh, to Heather Conley uh, for really taking the lead and is the pioneer, I think, in the Washington area in the policy community on work on the Arctic going back five years in these hallowed halls of the house that Ham rebuilt, as I refer to our new building. Uh, Heather is uh, familiarly known as the Polar Princess, and uh, most, of, most, most, of, most of what I have learned, I have learned uh, from, uh, from Heather, and very grateful to be working with her uh, together on this, on this project. I'd also like to ex express a special thanks uh, to Andrei, Andrei Zagorski, uh, an old friend of more than, more than 20 years uh, working together in various, uh, <coughs> various different uh, modalities, and uh, probably Andrei is the second person that I've learned the most from. Uh, about, about the Arctic, and particularly uh, in a couple of conferences uh, that were held last fall, the one in December that uh, we and the Pew Charitable Trust uh, did together with the, uh, the Russian International Affairs Council in, uh, in early December has already been referred to, but there was also a very useful uh, and important conference that was uh, held jointly by uh, CIPRI and IMAMO in, which, uh, in, in Moscow in, uh, end of the end of September, in which uh, Andrei was also the uh, uh, well, as I think the Russians uh, would say, the motor, the motor, uh, which uh, if anyone needs a translation, that's the motor, okay, <clears throat> behind. Um, you, know, at, you know, last summer and uh, the, fall of la the fall of last year, the U.S.-Russia relationship was not in very good shape. I mean, I know with uh, what's happened in the last few months, uh, things are much, are much bleaker, but things were pretty bleak then. But it was clear to us then that this area of work is one in which we share a lot of common interests. Uh, just parenthetically, a lot of people now are talking about you know, Russia's pivot to Asia and the, and, uh, the, the great potential for the Sino-Russian Sino relationship. You know, let's not forget that I think a year or so ago at the last time the Arctic Council, Council met, I don't think that uh, our Russian colleagues were that enthusiastic about uh, China's uh, uh, application for observer status within the Council. They were very, very enthusiastic, however, about, uh, about, about Japan. And it's important to keep things like this in, in context, and somehow we must find a way to actually to walk and chew gum uh, at, the, at the same time. Those common interests that we share on the Arctic, they have not gone away. They are there. And it would seem uh, rather silly, but this happens all the time on policy issues in Washington, and not only in Washington, this spillover effect, where unfortunately we seem to cut off our nose to spite our face by failing to move forward in one area of, one area of uh, cooperation when the overall relationship is spoiled by, by, by something else. So hopefully with this effort uh, today and our continued efforts, we can try to overcome uh, this, uh, this problem. And a great place to start uh, with this is in the area of scientific uh, research uh, and, uh, and cooperation. Uh, this, you know, a, a, a clear database, a uh, clear understanding of what the actual facts are on the ground or in the water, as this may be, is, or under the, under the water, is something that everybody is going to, is going to, uh, to benefit on. And uh, that is the, the topic for our panel uh, right, right now. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to change the order somewhat, and we're going to start, start with uh, Ray Ar Arnaudo. Um, I've just probably massacred your last name, Ray. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Ray is uh, currently a senior scholar at the Center for Science Diplomacy, and after working for many years in the U.S. government uh, with a tremendous amount of experience in environmental and science policy affairs. 
Most recently, he served as the head of the U.S. Antarctic uh, Treaty Secretariat, and prior to this, he was the senior advisor for nuclear energy or multilateral nuclear cooperation with the Department of Energy at the American Embassy in Moscow from 2006 to 2008. Uh, he had previously served uh, as acting or deputy director of the Office of Ocean Affairs and has also served as the science and environment counselor at the American Embassy in London and U.S. permanent representative at the U.N. International Maritime or Organization. And Ray is going to kick things off and kind of set the table by talking about the history, I think, uh, of uh, scientific cooperation and research in this area. Thanks, Andy. Um, Actually, the pronunciation of my name is Italian, and that was very good. It was perfect. Arnaudo. But bellissimo. Okay, go there. Um, well, I'm happy to be here. I'm delighted to see so many people paying attention to the Arctic. Um, Andy mentioned I have a, a, a somewhat long history working on environment and science affairs for the State Department, um, but I was also there at the, at the beginnings of uh, cooperation in the Arctic. And uh, I would have been happy to have just a tenth of this kind of audience at a meeting on the Arctic in the late 80s when simply no one was paying attention to Arctic cooperation. Um, and that made my job sort of easy in a way because if you don't have to consult with tons of people, you can get things done more easily. And we were able to put together the beginnings of the, uh, of the uh, Arctic Environmental Protection uh, Group, which then became the Arctic Council. So what I'd like to do, um, if those of you wondering why retired diplomats here on the science panel, um, I did take a couple of courses in biology and, and physics in college, but uh, no, I think my purpose here is really to sketch a little bit about the history of the council and the importance of science mm -hmm. to getting to the point where the council is now. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's a general conclusion that science is at the, at the foundations of both the beginnings of the council and the cooperation and certainly activities it has now. Um, so just to begin the process in the 80s, there really was no international cooperation forum, no group that could uh, address the issues of cooperation. There was a French organization that did some science, the Comité Arctique, uh, but it was fairly dormant. And this was when um, Scandinavians, uh, essentially the Finns, began the process by pushing for some type of Arctic convention or cooperation. Uh, I think the main purpose was to make sure that we could work with the Soviets at the time on questions about um, pollution and development in the Arctic. Uh, Scandinavian countries more concerned, air pollution, riverborne pollution coming out into the Arctic Ocean. Um, the United States initially was uh, wary of yet another international organization, and I spent the first year or so of this discussion saying no to prospects of cooperation. Um, but at a point, it became apparent that the eight Arctic countries had a lot to talk about and that there really needed to be um, a forum that we could do this in. The response of the Russians or the Soviets at the time was, was not very uh, enthusiastic, but it came as there was more and more dialogue. And I would mention, sort of as a tip of the hat to CSIS and other NGO groups, uh, it was because of a lot of discussions that were, that were pushed by uh, non-governmental organizations to get us policy discussions together. And, uh, and that prompted some responses from the Russians and eventually in this famous speech by Gorbachev in the mid-80s in which he talked about a number of things and then talked about cooperation in the Arctic. And his speech came up with uh, lines that were really mirroring things we were talking about. So it was apparent there was something to, something to do. The Canadians, too, were very, uh, very helpful in this process. I mean, they, have, they and the Russians have huge portions of the Arctic uh, coastline and were anxious to get cooperation together. And so they pushed a lot of the initial formulations. Um, and this gets to the part of science, because the, uh, the formative discussions we had uh, about cooperation were started by a number of research papers and discussions about things uh, such as airborne pollution, uh, protection of wildlife, fauna and flora, uh, questions of uh, emergency reaction to accidents and pollution spills, et cetera. Uh, and that became the foundation for the, for the organization we have today, which is uh, working groups that address those issues. But, but the uh, initial formulation was to bring our scientists together to talk, write papers on and discuss these issues and keep it, I think, um, a little bit less than political. That is to say, the purpose of this is to get the people of the North together and talk about problems that affect them all. Uh, and that was successful. And we put together the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy 
which uh, lasted for a few years when it became apparent that a stronger and more, let's say, political or more national organization was necessary, and that morphed into the uh, Arctic Council. First meeting was held in, in Canada, followed by us. But one of the, um, in, in all parts of this, I'd say the delegations of the teams were made up of, of uh, with strong science backgrounds, because it was apparent that's where the strength of the cooperation lie. Uh, and in this regard, one of the first things the United States did as we morphed into the Arctic Council was to kick off a, a discussion about climate. Uh, and that was led by NSF. Bob Correll took the lead on discussions about how we might do more uh, to address the issue of, uh, of climate impact, and especially significant in the Arctic. And, and in that regard, on the science front, underpinning these discussions uh, virtually the same time and concluding earlier was the International Arctic Science Committee. Uh, and those that, again, initiated by science groups, some government, some non-government, uh, I think it was NSF who had the lead for the United States, and it talked about the need for an organization that could get better cooperation between science, science communities, scientists in the Arctic. Uh, there was a pretty heated debate and took quite a while to resolve the question of whether this was to be just Arctic, eight countries, five countries talking about things Arctic, or whether to include uh, all the scientists of the world, an international group. Uh, and the solution, of course, was a typ typical diplomatic solution. It did both things. There was a regional board that, uh, that had the eight, and then there was, it was open to all, which, of course, was all the, always the U.S. position, which is to be as, as open and, and, um, and inclusive as you can on the science front. So as a result, IASC was formed. Um, it began doing its research cooperation, and I think that led, uh, led to a path uh, of greater cooperation, and that led where we are today of... Uh, of the, them working as a science support group for the Arctic Council, all of which I think is, has, been, uh, has been helpful. And, um, and if anything, and it'll be talked about, I think, with my collaborators here, is the need for the ongoing cooperation and continued work. Um, that, you know, turned to today where we are on this, I think you'll find that all the major working groups of the Council are uh, based on participation by our national science groups. That's the way it works, and that's, I think, the best part of this. You really have internationalized the cooperation of the Council through the fact that it's, uh, it's science-based, and that's one of the major goals. Council did morph into discussions about sustainable development, and that gets to our questions from some of the past discussions of the previous panel about the need for more consideration about economic growth, sustainable development which has become the second pillar of, uh, of the Council's efforts, all to the good. But all those discussions, too, are, are uh, hinged on the support uh, by the research and the science that's done by the national delegations. Um, the last point I'd make is that, um, and I think two of the panelists are going to discuss some of this, but there is a specific task force uh, within the Arctic Council that is looking at these questions of how to improve uh, cooperation on the science front, whether it's logistics, uh, access to scientific regions, or just simply a better understanding of what all of us are doing. I think there's, a, there's great transparency in the science world about who's doing what research. But with regards to the Council, I think there's probably some improvements that can be made on the question of cooperation between the two. Uh, and I think that's gonna, that, that will be a result of uh, the task force discussions, and that's, that's being chaired by the U.S. and Russia and Norway. Uh, all those things should improve the cooperation. It's al already pretty good. So uh, I think that's a quick overview of how we started this and how we got to where we are. Um, and I think the, my other panelists are going to talk about specific U.S. interests in this, but if not, I'm happy to recap that at a point if there's time. Thanks. Ray, thank you very much. That was a perfect table setter, and uh, we will now segue into uh, some uh, the pres presentations of some of the act current uh, activities and programs. Uh, our first, uh, uh, our next panelist uh, to speak will be Dr. Kelly Faulkner, who is the director of the National Science Foundation's uh, Division of Polar Programs, a position she's held since 2012. Uh, she is a professor at Oregon State University's uh, College of Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences, uh, and from 2007 to 2009, she has served at the NSF 
as the founding program director of the Antarctic Integrated System Science Program. She served in the NSF's Division of Polar Programs in many capacities since 1998. Uh, her own research focuses on chemical oceanography, particular in uh, the polar regions. And as part of uh, uh, her research, she's participated in two dozen major expeditions. So uh, Kelly, welcome to, uh, to CSIS. Delighted to have you here today. And I'm delighted to be here, and I thank uh, CSIS for organizing this event. It's timely and, and a very interesting one. Um, so I would like to just comment on, on Ray's uh, nice summary of the history. I was on the other side of uh, the, the, the politics behind finding, uh, founding these um, bodies, but there was, at, in the 80s, uh, recognition growing among the science community that we were seeing very dramatic change. And we weren't quite sure what to do about it, but we were sure we needed to do something about it. Um, and I want to say that some of what he just described has been extremely important for giving voice to the issues that we were, were seeing early on. And science continues to be a very important player in, in informing uh, all domains of, of interest in the Arctic, of course. What I'd like to do is just make three points um, today. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, hopefully run a quick film here. What you're going to see in a moment is um, a summary on a year-by-year -year basis of where we have investigators supported by National Science Foundation and sometimes in partnership with other nations and other um, agencies, uh, research activities going on in the Arctic over the time frame you see. Uh, I'm going to show you both stations on land and ship tracks. I want to point out before we get going that science in the Arctic has inherently been international for a very long time. And as you'll see in a moment, and whoever's running this can go ahead and start it, um, we have activities covering all domains of science. It's a regionally defined program at the Science Foundation. We go all the way from microbiology to astrophysics and, and other things. But you start off seeing what are relatively permanent stations flagged in blue around the Arctic that are maintained. And then as the years roll through, starting 2007, the ship tracks, it's a little hard to see, but it looks like measles throughout the entire Arctic. <laughs> and those are, are uh, locations of, of activities that are supported. And I, I hope you notice that it really covers the entire Arctic but you can take a good look at that picture and realize that we really need to partner with all of the Arctic nations and others in order to cover that domain. Um, so as we come to the end, it's just gonna give you a composite of that five-year period. <clears throat> so one thing I do wanna stress, having spent uh, two decades working in the Arctic, is that it's a really hard place to work. <laughs> um, the, the combination of things you heard about earlier, storms, um, sea ice conditions, uh, just the difficulty of making equipment work under the extreme conditions you encounter there are inherently challenging for all scientists. So I think um, although we've been working together internationally for a while, we all recognize that given the inherent challenges to successful science in the Arctic, we really need to do our best to minimize other obstacles. Uh, and so in the spirit of that, I'd like to call your attention to, and, I, and my presentation visuals are over, but um, a couple of things going on that are cause for optimism in this regard. One, um, and this isn't a council-related activity, and I'm purposefully highlighting it because under something called the Belmont Forum, which is an outgrowth of G8 activity, um, we have just released an International Opportunities Fund call for the Arctic. It's specifically calling for proposals on Arctic observing and science for sustainability. Thirteen countries are involved in that. Um, many of the players would be familiar to you. Uh, of course, the U.S. is, Canada, many European countries, and Russia are among the partners in this particular endeavor. The way this kind of competition works was set up so that we could encourage international collaboration because people could be ensured that the review process for proposals took place all at the same time under the same rules so that people would know the outcome 
of the competition in, in an international context. We've had issues in the past where independently agencies in different countries would like to study something similar, but it was difficult to take advantage of making synergies because there would be different timings or, or uh, different priorities and so forth. So this mechanism is allowing us to push out on coordinating at an international level. These particular proposals require at least three countries to be involved, and um, each of the countries ends up funding its successful proposals. Um, and this particular project also requires uh, people address the nexus of the natural sciences with economic and social sciences in the Arctic. So we're really trying to push out on getting the best ideas going forward uh, in, the, in the realm of sustainability, uh, fully informed by, by uh, a range of considerations. So that is actually going to close on July 31st. Um, there's about a 20 million euro equivalent investment in this program, and uh, it'll be exciting to see what does come out of that. Um, so it's actually just um, in passing, um, we've done the Belmont Forum approach in different areas of the world for research three times before. The global interest in the Arctic pushed it to the top as a priority topic, so that it's the fourth topic out of the chute in that particular forum. That's not an Arctic Council activity, but many of the Arctic, uh, all of the Arctic nations are involved, and, and many of the observers are involved. So, and the one other thing I'd like to highlight is something that uh, Ray already mentioned. He talked about uh, activity under the Arctic Council it, to also enhance science cooperation. That activity has been underway. It's an ad hoc task force to enhance science cooperation. And so the, um, that came out of the uh, Karuna Accord, and it was agreed that cooperation in scientific research across the circumpolar Arctic is of great importance to the work of the Arctic Council, and the task force was established to work towards an arrangement on improved research cooperation among the eight Arctic states. So we started last September meeting, um, and our first meeting uh, was in Sweden. And by the way, the, the uh, chairs of this task force include the U.S. under Evan Bloom at State Department, uh, Sweden with Gustav Lind and Russia, and that leadership is changing out as Russia is uh, transitioning its senior Arctic official um, capacity right now. So we are making good progress. Um, I think John Farrell is going, going to address shortly some more specifics regarding um, the situation with Russia and other things, so I'll, I'll keep my comments at a high level. What I'd like to say is that, as a group, we recognize that there are many very active science bodies that are non-political, who are out there trying to arrange for better cooperation and coordination among scientists. In the current budget climate, which is challenging a number of nations, it's incumbent on all of us to actually coordinate better to leverage what we can and particularly since you see uh, on the map, we have, um, in order to understand Arctic change, we have to address the entire Arctic region. So the group, the task force agreed right away that its job wasn't to set new science priorities, but was to take full advantage of ones that are being set by these bodies and do what we can to best facilitate that. We've heard from a number of these bodies as part of our process the International Ar Arctic uh, Science Committee that Ray mentioned, from the World Meteorological Organization, which has a strong Arctic focus right now, from the University of the Arctic, which is a consortium of, of universities and, and colleges throughout the Arctic, who just recently had a 10-year review of their, their consortium and came to the conclusion they were doing a good job connecting on the education level, uh, but that going forward, they really needed to connect better for uh, purposes of facilitating research of all sorts. Um, there's a, an International Arctic uh, Social Science Association. There are working groups of the Council. There's the Forum for Arctic Research Operators. There's a whole alphabet soup of acronyms of people who are involved one way or another in trying to look at important problems and how we make good traction on them in the Arctic. 
So I think the good thing about this right now is that there was a time, because it is hard to work in the Arctic, you tend to attract a scrappy bunch that people would would been a bit territorial as they set up committees to do things and argued for funds or what have you. But I think it's very much the spirit these days that um, we know we can't go it alone. We can't tackle the big questions alone, and it doesn't make sense to fight over them, but to align where we can. And so I think this um, ad hoc task force very much is working in that spirit. Um, we have come to uh, by and large agreement on a non-politically binding text, but at our last meeting in uh, Reykjavik just a short while ago, after much deliberation, we decided that we would try by September 1st to get all of the nations to get negotiating authority to enter into a legally binding arrangement to facilitate cooperation for science. Um, this is a big order, and um, I don't know at this point we're guaranteed to succeed, but the will is there to try, and everybody's pushing out in that direction. Uh, I think it's safe to say that Russia is an impetus in part for going in this direction, because um, they were arguing that it would have much more clout and help them in terms of aligning resources towards research and important research problems. Um, and so. As I said, we're all marching towards that. So we have an, our next meeting, and it will, it'll be a, a juncture there, whether we're negotiating that binding text or um, not having uh, achieved the authorities uh, for all nations, whether we continue on our, our agreement. So some of the issues, just to, just to uh, give it to you in a nutshell, are that we think there are things we can do to enhance the exchange of people, samples, equipment, and, um, and make sure that they can transition borders more readily so that that isn't an obstacle to efficiency in getting science done. We also feel, particularly in the marine uh, area, that there are things we can do to enhance uh, the pace at which we're able to get appropriate permits and so forth to, to work in throughout the entire Arctic. So with that, um, I'm, I'm hoping we can build on many successes that we have in, in various areas of cooperation with all of the Arctic eight nations and, um, and spread that success to more domains of science and, and better efficiency of science. Thank you. Amen. Um, <clears throat> no, uh, no pushback for me on that uh, on that conclusion, Kelly. Thanks so much for a terrific overview of uh, uh, NSF's act activities, the task force, and uh, also the uh, the Belmont Forum. Something I was not 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 aware of. Uh, for the next presentation, let me now turn to my right to an old friend, uh, Dr. Maria Leventova, uh, who is the International Health Program Officer at the National Institutes of uh, of Health. Uh, where she has uh, held the position of Program Officer for Russia, Eurasia, and Arctic Affairs since 2006. Uh, she directs and coordinates research on biomedical and behavioral health. Before joining NIH, uh, Dr. Leventova worked at the Alcohol Research Group at U UC Berkeley School of Public Health, studying the impact of alcohol control policies in the Russian Federation. And she's also researched Russian health and demographics, uh, particularly non-communicable diseases at the University of California at San Francisco, yay, my hometown, uh, and the University of Hawaii, yay, pretty nice place to visit. <laughs> Maria, uh, for a number of years at CSIS uh, working with the, uh, the Global Health Initiative, uh, we had a very active program uh, looking at uh, U.S. and Russian uh, cooperation on health, uh, health issues uh, that uh, Maria was a very active and, uh, uh, and um, productive and construct, constructive member of. So it's, it's a real pleasure to see you again here this morning. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, thank you very much to the, to the organizers to, um, to have NIH participate in this conference. And uh, it gives me a special pleasure because health is being recognized as part of an important, um, not just research issue, but uh, an important topic of concern. 
for the Arctic, because as all of you know, if we don't have a healthy population of individuals living above the circumpolar, all of the different uh, business and uh, fisheries, every single topic that you're interested in discussing here will be adversely affected if we actually do not look at the health of the individuals living in that part of the world. With that being said, um, it's important to recognize that research in health, and you can look at health in the broadest sense, every topic in the biomedical and behavioral fields is very limited in the Arctic. It is limited to such a point that I did a search just recently, uh, you know, specifically for this meeting to look at what NIH is currently supporting in the Arctic. There's not a single project that comes up that is international, okay? Uh, with that, out of $19 million that were spent in fiscal year 2013, majority of it is not in Alaska. Majority of it is in other states, Colorado, Minnesota, you know, you name it, Massachusetts. What does that mean? I mean, if you think about what does that actually mean to the research in the Arctic and how is the U.S. federal government supporting this mission? So what makes us, one point that I want to make um, before I uh, kind of explain how the NIH thinks and funds research is to explain how we're different from the NSF programs. So NIH is able to support any scientist anywhere in the world in a direct <coughs> award, meaning you can be in any country in the world, you have a great idea, you submit your project to the NIH for consideration. The NIH goes through its review, which takes about nine months, then you finally might have a baby uh, to, uh, to do your work with. Um, and none of these projects are regionally focused. So that also makes us very different from a lot of other agencies interested in the Arctic in the U.S. federal government. All of our work is disease specific. So out of the 27 institutes and centers at the NIH, if you look at their names, you'll know exactly what they're interested in. So Cancer Institute, they're interested in cancer. They're not interested in regional issues that might affect da 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 da. They're interested in cancer, and they will focus their research support on cancer. So you have to figure out how to market your project to fit with their priorities. Same goes for all of the institutes. So that makes us very different from NSF um, in, in our funding priorities. So with that said, with Arctic not being a recognized area of priority for the NIH, how do the scientists actually get funded? And why is it so many grants go to other states or to scientists in other states besides Alaska and why there isn't a single project that is coded as Arctic that is international? Scientists apply, there's thousands and thousands of individuals that submit about six to 10% get a grant. So if you are not a top-notch scientist with a top-notch research program, the chances are you will not get a grant. This is one of the reasons why Alaska scientists are not as successful in obtaining these funding. So they have to form some kind of a collaborative relationship with someone that already has NIH grants, that already has proven that they are worthy that they are top-notch to obtain NIH funding. And many people, as, as people go, you know, our psychology is pretty much the same. You fail once or twice, you don't go back again, right? I mean, why would you keep knocking on the same door that never opens? So people don't continue going back to request funding from the NIH. They go to other entities. They go to the Canadian funding agencies. And this is one of the pathways we've been trying to, uh, to look at at the NIH specifically for looking at issues that are relevant to Arctic health. Can we cooperate or develop some kind of a collaborative relationships, partnerships with other countries above the circumpolar where we can develop these special programs that would be specifically focused on the Arctic? Um, during my tenure, which has been a little long, a little short, depends on your time frame, um, we have not been successful in developing anything of that nature. And the reason, again, goes back to the fact that NIH institutes are interested in diseases, not regions. The only movement that we've had, and John and I have been beating our heads against uh, 
many walls on this, is that finally we're seeing some movement in the three institutes at the NIH, National Institute of Mental Health, National Institute on Drug Abuse, and Alcohol Institute, at least a consideration to develop something that would look specifically at behavioral and mental health issues in the Arctic, which is one of the biggest burdens for individuals living above the circumpolar. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen um, many articles in, in the newspapers about the suicide rates in that part of the world, uh, which is a, a big issue. Um, so if, if these institutes are able to persevere through all the different priority areas of, of their institutes that might interfere with developing an initiative that is specifically focused on the Arctic populations, uh, if they're able to persevere, then we will have an initiative, then we will have a grant program that will specifically look at a regional health issue. Until that point, the scientists have to push, I mean, it's a bottom-up approach. The scientists have to come up with good topics, good proposals, strong methods, and they have to put them forward to the NIH. So if you're interested in kind of the general um, layout of what is currently being supported by the NIH in Alaska, very few projects are focused on behavioral mental health. If we, if we try to rate the different uh, priority issues, that is probably priority number one, and there's three projects that are focused on behavioral mental health. And according to, the, to many different scientists, there are not very strong projects. So there is a lot more work that needs to be done, and this really has to be a bottom-up approach. So because the NIH can't really dictate to the scientists what they are to study, they have to come up with their own research. Um, we, we have to listen to them, and uh, if they're asking, if there is a, a continuous flood of inquiries and requests and um, questions about the topics, then there will be a shift. But if the scientists don't come knocking on the doors of individuals at the NIH that determine which grant programs will go forward, it's not going to change, which I think has been kind of the perpetuating problem is that when, when I talk to the scientists in Alaska, they say, well, I submitted my grant and it didn't get funded. Okay, well, did you go back to the program officer? Did you tell them how important it is? Are you, are you continuing to do your advocacy? Basically, it's advocacy. No, I'm not. So this is where some of these, some of these bottleneck, bottlenecks occur, is that even though the need is there, the individuals that could be helpful are not being pursued <laughs> to move this need forward. So, um, so that's kind of on the NIH front. Um, as far as looking outside of the NIH, um, the Sustainable Working Group of the Arctic Council has been very active in trying to move some of the uh, areas of health cooperation forward. Um, uh, Alan Parkinson at the CDC in Alaska has been the, the, leader, the leader on this uh, for the Arctic Human Health Initiative. Majority of their work is focused on surveillance which NIH does not consider to be research. Um, so it, it, is, um, it is important work, but it doesn't very well mesh with what the NIH is uh, mandated to support. So it becomes a, uh, a siloed activity, and Alan and I have tried for many years to figure out how we can uh, combine these, uh, align them, make them more friendly, um, but I think because the federal agencies are so separately and individually um, mandated, guided, uh, determined, it's been difficult. So the, the one major opportunity I see is to actually develop some kind of collaborations with foreign countries, uh, and Canada being really one of the most uh, potentially fruitful at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I'm not a trained psychologist, but I do detect a certain degree of frustration. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it does seem striking that uh, 
uh, with your job title uh, as the uh, International Health Program Officer for Russia, Eurasia, and Arctic Affairs. Now, that's a regional title, yet uh, regions are not um, the, on the basis upon which uh, decisions and alloc about allocations of funding, funding are made. Um, hmm. uh, maybe we'll get, more, get to that more in the discussion. Uh, let me now turn to our, uh, our, our final speaker, our, our cleanup batter, uh, Dr. John Farrell, uh, who is the Executive Director of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, independent federal agency of presidential appointees that advises the White House and Congress on Arctic research matters and works with executive branch agencies to enact a national Arctic research plan. Previously, Dr. Farrell served as Associate Dean of Research and Administration at the Graduate School of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island, and he was also Director of the International Ocean Drilling Program aimed towards advancing a deeper scientific understanding of the Earth. Dr. Farrell uh, helped organize and conduct uh, the first successful international scientific ocean drilling expedition to the high Arctic in 2004. He was also instrumental in facilitating a U.S. ocean mapping effort of aboard the U.S. icebreaker, U.S. CGC Healy in 2012, and he also has a terrific cartoon which will start his presentation, uh, which I hope he did not take out of his present presentation. Uh, Dr. Farrell, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here to CSIS today. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you to Heather for inviting me here today, and I must say I really like your new digs. Uh, and I don't know why GSA, when they, when they renegotiated our lease, didn't give this as one of our options. Well, and the, and, and the collection basket will be coming around <laughs> yeah. shortly. Okay. Um, I'll give you a minute to look at this. Uh, I'm a scientist, and so I'm in a room full of uh, people much smarter and much more skilled in diplomacy and geopolitics, so I thought I would try to ease my way in with something along your line. Some, some great Canadian cartoons, uh, and this is one, um, and the second one sort of speaks to Dave Balton's issue, and for those of you in the crowd, I see a lot of gray hair, so you'll remember who these characters are, Richard Nixon and Pierre Trudeau. And this was based on a, on a, a right guard commercial back in the 70s. But you see the sovereignty, you see the boundaries, you see between the two nations. So I just, just thought that these issues are nothing new. This goes back 40 years now. So I thought I'd start with that before jumping into my science. It's too bad his lovely wife is out here. <laughs> yeah, we know where she was. <laughs> Okay, this is one of my favorite pictures of uh, international scientific cooperation. It, and it, for the non-mariners in the room, it may be uh, uh, hard to figure out what this actually is. This is a picture looking down from a helicopter way up high near the North Pole, and you see these little trails. There's actually three ships in this slide. There's a Russian nuclear icebreaker, there's a Swedish ship, and then there's a little drill ship in the back. And you can see big chunks of ice to the top and bottom and a sort of a stream in the middle of finer ice. That's all because it's been broken up by these ships. And the little ship there on the very right-hand side, you can hardly see a trail behind it, that's actually drilling into the seafloor there. Um, so it's stuck in the seafloor while the ships in front of it are defending and breaking ice in advance of it. So here's a look at that. There's the three ships uh, from left to right. Uh, uh, Soviet Soyuz, the middle one, the, the Odin from Sweden, and on the right, the Norwegian Vidar Viking. That's the drill ship. So this is a perfect example of scientific cooperation in the Arctic in that uh, it represents 22 countries coming together, commingling funds to conduct, uh, at this point, it was a $13 million expedition in 2004. Uh, there, was si there was international input in developing the science plan and in, and in conducting the expedition itself. Um, and even in terms of icebreaker captains, typically like in the upper left-hand picture, that's sort of how you see icebreakers often transiting. They're in a row, they're going through some place from point X to point Y. But on the right, you see them in a very different mode. That's where the ship on the bottom left is actually drilling into the sea floor and the two ships out in front are, are defending and are breaking up ice, and there's a complicated ice management system in order for this to happen. So it's an exquisite example of different countries coming together uh, to work on a scientific uh, issue. Uh, it's more than just ships, it's people fundamentally. 
Uh, in the upper left, you have this ice management crew. A lot of these people now are working in industry, like in Sakhalin. In the upper right, you've got a Russian uh, skipper on the left and a Swedish skipper on the right. They were almost like the commodores of this fleet, uh, training a lot of people in how to work together to do this very complicated situation. Um, you even have mundane things like holding up the propeller while you're trying to get your helicopter assembled to start flying around. And the bottom right, a typical Arctic research picture shows all the flags and all the participants in this particular expedition. Uh, it was very highly successful, and talk about outside Arctic characters, here's a drilling crew. Uh, they're from Cornwall, UK. They'd never been in the Arctic, but they really knew their way around a drill rig, and they were quite happy. To, they thought they were near the North Pole, not quite, but close enough. Uh, and uh, so they were very happy and proud of their effort to, to help advance the scientific team. So you've got teams of people from Cornwall whose English I could barely understand given their dialect and accent. You had uh, representatives from at least 12, 15 different countries on this actual expedition. Very successful. The whole purpose was to drill into the seafloor to understand the geologic evolution of this Arctic Ocean Basin. Had never been done before because of technical cost challenges. Well, they were quite successful, um, and uh, we published the results uh, a couple of years later in uh, Nature. So it was a first look at the whole 65 million year history of the evolution of the Arctic Ocean Basin. Um, so a lot of applied app, uh, information that comes out of this, such as the location distribution of oil and gas resources, history of the basin, which also helps inform things like uh, delimitation of extended continental shelves, uh, also on climate change. Uh, we find out during the Eocene 35 million years ago, this was a very, very warm ice-free ocean. What were the natural causes of this? So all, a whole wealth of information came out from this first expedition, which is the first look at the deep time history of the Arctic Basin. So that's, that's one example that I want to talk about. Also, I'll talk about a couple other examples of successful international uh, uh, cooperation in the Arctic. And then I also want to talk about a few challenges that we still have. Uh, I'd like to call attention to Norway's great efforts, and, and in addition to Norway, I should also mention in town in particular, Finland I think has been a big champion, as has Canada, uh, on having these dialogues, on fostering discussion on not just scientific cooperation, but also on uh, a variety of fronts in the Arctic. All three have been very strong, and Russia too. Uh, but in particular, I'd like to call attention to uh, two things about Norway I've found interesting, is they host a, a regular transit uh, Atlantic Science Week. This year it'll be in Toronto in October. So they work very hard to bring scientists and communities together to foster collaboration, to foster cooperation by hosting these kinds of conferences. Uh, they also have on uh, Svalbard, the island way up north, uh, uh, a little, I call it a sort of a research village there, if you will. <laughs> many, many countries, including a lot of non-Arctic nations, have little research stations there, and it's an opportunity for them to collaborate and cooperate on, and dip their toes in some cases in Arctic research. And in the upper right, you see a, a Norwegian in the middle flanked by some Chinese scientists who have opened a, a research station in, uh, that's their Arctic research station on land. Um, there was supposed to be, and, and there certainly is a, a focus on uh, working with Russia. So I'd like to give a couple real specific examples of how there's been good scientific and research cooperation in the Arctic with Russia on an international basis. This, this is a bilateral, two examples of bilateral efforts. One is the Beringia Heritage Program. So Beringia is the fabled land between uh, Alaska and Russia. and. Uh, the National Park Service actually has a program. They put in a little over half a million dollars a year to help work on cultural and scientific issues. And on the upper left is one of those called so-called stinky gray whales uh, that has been of common interest. So Russia and US work very closely because these peoples are connected. They're only separated by a 50 mile strait here. And so there's a lot of common heritage, a lot of common interest. And I think there's been a lot of good work that the Department of of interior has supported here. Um, and this actually was kicked off when uh, and George Bush and Mikhail Gorbachev uh, had made a commitment towards this way back when. And, and this still continues to today in the Park Service. On the right is uh, an example of an Arctic Observing Network project sponsored by Kelly's organization, uh, the National Science Foundation. It's called the Bering Sea Sub Network. 
And these scientists have identified uh, five, six, seven, eight communities, uh, half on uh, the Alaskan side and half on the Russian side. And uh, this group is, is working very hard, and this speaks to Caitlin Antrim's uh, issue about regional networks and regional emphasis. Uh, and they're looking at, to understand the interest of the local communities. They're looking at harvest intensity, for example, of marine mammals. You see on the lower right, St. Lawrence Island, it shows a snapshot of where there's heavy subsistence hunting going on. So uh, this is looking at local interests, looking at local understandings of climate change and what their impacts have, and have been, and also how are they responding to some of these changes. So it's a, it's a good example of an Arctic observing network project on a regional scale. I, I would say well, in terms of challenges, uh, I'm very pleased about the Belmont Forum opportunity for funding of Arctic Observing Network, but I, would, I think we have a lot further to go to do truly pan-Arctic uh, Arctic observing efforts. And this has been an activity that's in, been in the Arctic Council, the Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks. There's been, I would say, this is an area that we have not made as much progress as we should. Um, it's been called out. There's been a lot of planning meetings, a lot of interest, but it, it has not really matured to the point of a strong international program, commingled funds, common science plan, like, say, that international ocean drilling expedition that I showed earlier. I think this is just for lack of leadership, will, and, of course, resources. But I think that's what's going to take uh, to really amp this up into a truly circum polar Arctic observing network. This is a good example of a regional bilateral effort, but we need to do better. Um, another example of a nice bilateral effort is the Rizalka, the Russian-American long-term census of the Arctic. And it's nice to see John Calder here, uh, who he helped get this going when he was at NOAA. Uh, this is a long-term marine program. You can see it was signed off on, on the left, there's Connie um, uh, Lautenbacher from NOAA signing with his counterpart. Uh, this activity of marine research is conducted under some S&T agreements and an MOU. Uh, there are Russian entities, the Russian Academy of Sciences is leadership on the right, the U.S. entities on the, on, sorry, on the left and on the right is U.S. Interestingly, in, in this case, there has actually been the engagement with a private-public partnership entity called Group Alliance. And that's interesting to see because a lot of times when it's U.S. or bilateral efforts, it's just nation to nation. So in this case, this partnership has been engaged with this group alliance to actually facilitate access and coordination, and that has helped. Now, some naysayers might say, well, that's a pay-to-play type of organization. Uh, how, how are they really part of the scientific enterprise? So it's an interesting discussion, and it's an interesting model in terms of how bilateral uh, work is done. Um, but it's very active, it's very engaged, and I would say it's been an extremely successful enterprise. They have found things like the amount of uh, warm water flowing in the Arctic has increased significantly, the amount of fresh water flowing into the Arctic. Uh, this may have some significant impact on the diminishment of Arctic sea ice, not just air temperature, but warm water flowing through the straits. A lot of fresh, warm water, uh, fascinating results. And this very summer, in fact, in another couple of weeks, they will be embarking out of Anandir uh, on that, some ship tracks between Alaska and Russia showing where they will be doing uh, marine sampling programs of water, biology, chemistry, all kinds of physical properties. Um, a very nice program. I'd very much like to see this uh, continue when this program is up for renewal in 2015. I think Noah deserves a lot of credit for this, and Kathy Crane in particular, as well as John. There are this summer, there's going to be seven non-U.S. ships operating in the U.S. Arctic. Uh, and let's see if I can rattle them off. There's two Canadian vessels, the Amundsen and the Laurier. There is the Chinese Shulong. There's the Aran from Korea. There's the Mirai from Japan. There's the Odin from Sweden. And there's the Kromov. There will be seven vessels. U.S. investigators will be on many of those vessels in a collaborative type of effort, which is very good to see. The Healy is doing three expeditions in the Arctic this summer. Um, I'm not quite sure if there are actually more U.S. investigators total on all the foreign vessels combined compared to the three legs on the Healy, but it would be fun to run the numbers. 
but I think that's something that's probably underappreciated, how many U.S. investigators are actually sailing on foreign flagged vessels doing research in the U.S. Arctic. So here's China's Shui Long. Uh, it's, again, leaving, in, it'll be there in a couple weeks, and you see an extensive number of sites in the Arctic, in the Bering Sea, Chukchi, even up into the Beaufort, way up onto the, the cap there. They're going to be taking water samples and taking sediment cores. They'll be doing no ports of call, uh, but the other non-U.S. vessels will. The Japanese ship's coming in, uh, so there's a lot of activity this summer from research vessels, uh, domestic and uh, foreign. Now, I'm going to close with two final slides. One of the challenges, and this is a challenge that we face, uh, is that we request permission to conduct research in foreign EEZs, exclusive economic zones. And this chart here is data that I've, I've uh, worked with people at State Department to collect, which shows the number of times over since 1990, almost a 25-year history, that the U.S. has requested permission to enter the EEZ to do marine scientific research. And every time that request has been approved, it's green. And every time it's been denied, it's in red. And so you can see that over this almost 25-year period, there's been about 48 requests for permission to enter for marine scientific research. A little over 40% of the time, that request has been denied. And that's an obstacle to international scientific cooperation. Uh, I won't get into the reasons why, because sometimes it's not very well known. Uh, I think in some cases, there have been significant improvements. Initial Pollock surveys, for example, a lot of them were denied early on, but now they are being routinely approved, which is a good news story. But this can be very deleterious for science. We've had a drill ship sailing towards the site, waiting for permission, not getting it, having to turn back, costs us at $1.5 million of wasted money because we can't get that permission. This is where I'd like to see our two nations work better to try to reduce these number of times that there's denials. Um, some people have looked at this and said, well, you know, is there any pattern to this? I mean, I do notice during the 90s, which is a golden decade of cooperation, uh, we certainly had a lot more activity. You see, there's even a many more times we're requesting permission uh, and a lot of approvals. Uh, so if you overlay time periods, you know, here's uh, uh, I don't know if you should make too much of something like this, but this is just a historical time marker. Uh, and we've certainly had many successes in more recent years and some in the past too, but it was just interesting to compare. So I'll close with this slide, which I've been talking up to now about government funding of research in the Arctic, but I think it's very important to recognize in industries funding in the Arctic as well. And last year at a conference we organized called Impacts of an Ice Diminished Arctic on uh, Naval and Maritime Operations, Gary Isaacson from Exxon showed this very slide, which was fascinating to me because what this speaks to is uh, the joint venture between Exxon Mobil and Rosneft. Part of that agreement was to invest in a research center. And uh, if you see those numbers at the bottom there, that's well over half a billion dollars. And that's not chump change in the Arctic research funding uh, area. That's, walking, that's real walking around money in my business. Um, so a lot of this is a very applied type of research compared to, say, basic uh, research, but it's still research nonetheless. And it's, uh, now, that said, a year has gone by, and I can find very precious little information on what's actually materialized. So, you know, Gary showed this slide. I reached out to him, haven't heard back recently, but uh, this is a provocative and intriguing opportunity given not only this jo joint venture, but the one between uh, Shell and, um, and Gazprom too. So there's gonna be a lot of plays, a lot of exploration, maybe even a little bit of exploration off Chukchi this summer uh, to keep your eyes on. And I think it will also impact in terms of scientific research. And I'll end with that, thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Just one quick follow-up question uh, on the, the, pre the, the slide previous to that. Uh, one striking thing is that the number of requests has fallen off so much in recent years. Do uh, you have an explanation for that? Well, there's a couple of interesting things. One, I think there's just less funding to try to do this type of work. The second thing, the Rizalka cruises are not included here because those are actually done through Group Alliance through Russia. 
So that wasn't a U.S. vessel trying to get into the Russian EEZ. It was a Russian ship already. So you didn't need to include it here. Uh, so those are two quick responses. Okay. Well, thanks so much to, uh, to all four panelists for very, very concise and informative uh, pre presentations. Uh, before we turn to start the uh, discussion, let me turn to uh, the <coughs> uh, Bellissima prin uh, Princesa uh, to clarify how long we have to go, Heather, on this, on this session. About 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Okay, terrific. Okay, so there is one fundamental ground rule uh, for the discussion. No biting. While the FIFA position on biting seems to be rather unclear to date, the position of CSIS is absolutely clear. No biting is allowed. But seriously, uh, when uh, uh, we turn to you and we'll, we'll collect questions a, a few at a time, um, uh, please identify yourself uh, for, the, for the panelists. I'd like to ask the, uh, the, the first question, uh, if I may exercise the prerogative of the, of the chair. And that is, uh, I did learn a couple of things uh, at the, particularly in the, the conference I went to in Moscow in, in September. One of them had to do with the, uh, the volume of, of shipping on the Northern Sea Route, a uh, question that came up uh, in the first, the first session. And I was, it was interesting to me to learn that uh, the Northern Sea Route was actually established in 1932, I mean, this was a Stalin-era era project. And the, uh, the amount of tonnage uh, that was carried on the Northern Sea Route peaked uh, in about 1987, 1988. Uh, and this is before significant uh, uh, ice melt began, began to take place. Now, um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the amount of tonnage uh, on, shipped on the Northern Sea Route uh, shrank to almost, almost zero. And it began to rise uh, in, more recent, in more recent years, but even uh, in the peak year, uh, in, the last few year in the last few years, that shipping level was at about 40% of what the peak level was back in 1987-88. So uh, the question, which was, I was surprised to learn that. Now, I think the answer as to why that is the case is likely that uh, during the Soviet period, uh, the Northern Sea Route, sea route was used I think, in, in non, under non-commercial non conditions, which I think gets to a point that will be highlighted later on in the discussion today about you know, how the commercial viability of uh, the Northern Sea Route and other um, Arctic, Arctic uh, transit, transit uh, corridors has to, be, has to be viable. Now, tied to that was something else that, uh, that I learned that I'd like to put this, this question to all of, all, of the, all of the panelists. And it was interesting to learn that there was a debate uh, in the Russian, the Russian scientific community about the, uh, uh, the pace uh, and, more importantly, the possible reversibility of the, the melting of, the, uh, of the, polar ice, the polar ice cap. And that, uh, if I correctly understood, I think in 2011 and possibly 2012, uh, rather than a greater amount of ice melting, there was a lesser amount of ice, ice that had melted for a year or two. I might have, don't have my facts exactly, exactly right. You know, I'm, a, I'm just a poor political scientist, and we all know that's a complete oxymoronic term, um, <clears throat> i.e. not a real scientist. But if, in fact, that is true, I was wondering, what is there any debate uh, here in this country about uh, the pace and, and, the, and possibly the irreversibility of, the, uh, of the, the melting of the ice cap? Now, the explanation if I, that I was put to me as to why there might have been more ice uh, for a year or, or two is that actually getting to the point that John mentioned about that the uh, <coughs> um, flows of water from the, uh, the Gulf Stream had been cooler, and that was one possible ex explanation. At any rate, I'd like to just uh, put that open to the panel uh, for some clarification if possible. I'll give one, one tack on this, this question. Um, so there's been research to try and discover whether or not, as we proceed towards the melting trajectory, we're going to hit some threshold beyond which it won't be readily reversible. Um, to date, from what we know about the sea ice cover, it doesn't look like there is such a threshold looming. Um, so if we were able to uh, do something to, to change the forcings that are putting us on the warming tra trajectory, not all is lost. So that's been the message from people doing modeling and so forth. 
So then the question turns to, well, what can we do? What should we be doing? What kind of research do we really need in order to inform what we could think about doing? Then we move into a pretty controversial area, but I think we all understand that we need to go there because we may find, given uh, you know, a lack of action in general across the world in, in the, the climate arena, that we may have our backs up against the wall with, with certain surprises, and we're going to want to be able to turn to tools. Um, I personally hope we're, we don't go there, but we, we may. So, so I think there has to be uh, investment in the geoengineering or, or even some of the mitigation uh, uh, factors that could be at play. Um, there's some very interesting research, for example, and anybody can find this online um, through the, we have an interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. And they've sponsored a lot of collaborative work across the agencies, trying to do better synergy at attacking certain issues. But there's several presentations regarding black carbon out there, which I think you may find interesting. But in this case, and I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name, there's someone at Stanford who's actually combined um, economics and uh, systems engineering with aerosol uh, scattering in clouds, fundamental research for contrails. And, and noted that, you know, if you, if you wanted to, you could divert, which are now over the pole flights, and there are many, uh, from an over the pole trajectory at a certain cost, you'd be increasing the length of the flights, in order to avoid putting black carbon into the atmosphere in the Arctic and trapping it in the polar vortex. Um, so, so there's more research to be done, I would say, I wouldn't jump out based on that, that one study, but there were indications that you could have a net benefit by, by changing practices there. For example, and there are plenty of other things people have talked about in the geoengineering realm. They don't all take place in the Arctic necessarily, but they may. Uh, so, so I think this is an area very ripe for investment and research to be sure that uh, we do understand our, our possibilities. And it's controversial because you, we, we may well not be able to engineer our way out of this uh, quickly or at all. But, but I think we should be pushing to understand what we can and can't do. I'll just make two short points. One, uh, the warming is going to continue. I mean, I th there's not going to be a reversal, Andrew, where there's going to be you know, a significant cooling. And that speaks to the second point. Climate change is a long-term thing. Weather is a short-term thing. And so what we see is noise on a trend. So if you have a particularly cold year, don't mistake that for the overall trend, I, I would say. Um, and so I think, you know, and you can talk to people like Brooks. I mean, I, the, the, the cake is baked, I think, to a great extent. And so I don't, you know, I think we will see trends, uh, but the overall, is going to be there. It's going to be continuing to warm. The ice is going to continue to diminish. Uh, and I think that's the, clearly the scientific consensus. Let me open up the, uh, the floor. I see Marjorie Balzer, first, first hand up. Others? Marjorie Mandelstam Balzer, Georgetown University. Uh, I noticed that on the uh, second, uh, on the last slide uh, from the ExxonMobil Ross Neff cooperation, that there was a priority orientation towards engaging indigenous peoples. My question is whether there is, are specific efforts to engage indigenous scientists. And by this, I mean not only indigenous. Uh, uh, peoples who have folk knowledge of their own environments, but actually people who are themselves uh, trained as scientists and are, are indigenous, because it's a direction that could uh, be productive. Thank you. Okay. Um, others? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, John Calder, uh, unaffiliated at the moment. Uh, oh, sorry. I have a question for Kelly. It's a very simple question, really, but on this uh, Belmont forum activity that you're working on um, that you mentioned. I, I'm wondering if you have any insight as to whether there are a number of Russian scientists, any Russian scientists who are participating in this process in any way, since we're focused here on U.S.-Russian cooperation. Can we tell if this process is going to be helpful in getting Russian participation in some way? Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
uh, hold that. I think we'll collect a, a number of questions and give each panelist an opportunity to, to respond. Yes, sir. Uh, Steve Winters, local researcher. Uh, on this uh, issue that was mentioned about the need to be able to transit borders uh, more freely in order to get science done, uh, in the case of Antarctica, I understand there's some controversy that's arisen because of the fact that uh, each nation is able to set up scientific research stations in any sector of Antarctica, and the Chinese have set up, for example, several, uh, more than uh, several uh, stations in the, in the Australian claimed sector, and this has upset the Australians and so forth and so on. So is there any downside to the uh, total freedom of scientific investigation such as appears in Antarctica? Okay, good question. Uh, one more. Going, going, gone. Uh, well, I don't know. We have. I think we're the only bunch. <laughs> Let's uh, uh, maybe start. Uh, maybe in reverse order uh, with uh, with John. Okay. On the indigenous question, uh, yeah, there are some real specific examples, uh, not only with indigenous scientists, but indigenous communities in general. And when you talk about scientists, you have to respect the, the indigenous knowledge that people have, so they may not have a formal degree per se, but they certainly have uh, a lot of experience. So some specifics, uh, Shell, for example, has an agreement with the North Slope Borough. Uh, that ena enables the North Slope Borough to do baseline studies program, $5 million a year. Uh, and they also have another one with the Northwest Arctic Borough. So these are opportunities where energy companies are uh, providing funds to Alaska Natives, including scientists in those communities, to pursue scientific research. Um, and I'll throw out a name, uh, Nikush Carlo, a PhD scientist in Athabaskan, who is the, exec who's the lead staffer on the Alaska Arctic Policy Commission. So, yes. Um, and I won't address the other two. Maria? Um, NIH actually has specific programs that are intended to engage individuals that are of minority groups, which includes Alaska Natives. And uh, there are a number of uh, Alaska Natives that currently have grants from the NIH. Um, Spiro Manson, one of them, um, he's in Colorado, and he um, does research uh, focused on indigenous populations. Um, and also, majority of the programs, projects that are to involve any kind of a human in Alaska has to go through a community participatory approach, which means that uh, usually the tribal groups are involved. Uh, somebody in the tribal community has to approve the project, and um, without that, none of them would occur. Well, I'll take on two of those. Um, the question about indigenous uh, people's participation um, is really a good softball question for discussions about their council because it was the council in its initial formulation, so well in the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, that set aside a special role for uh, permanent participants, as they were called, uh, which is to say representatives of native groups. And at the time, there were four of them. You know, at, um, Circumpolar Conference, uh, the Peoples of Russia, etc. Um, and they have a different role than in most international organizations, and that is they stand at sort of uh, on par or a step above the observer countries, as well as the uh, NGO groups that are there. So the, the role of the indigenous participants to access the decision-making process is pretty clearly specified in the, in the Arctic Council structure, which I think is a really good idea. Um, I note the last uh, meeting of the Arctic Council had a specific discussion about the um, uh, role of traditional knowledge and cooperation with scientists in this regard. So I think that's all, uh, th certainly the right approach. Um, uh, the success depends on, on a longer look, I think. Um, on the question about Antarctica and, uh, and international cooperation, um, this is pretty straightforward uh, under the Antarctic Treaty. Countries um, maintain claims, there's seven of them that say they claim parts of it, um, the other participants, and there's 50 signatories to the treaty, um, do not acknowledge those claims. I mean, they, they note that they're there, but we don't show passports or visas when we go into the so-called Argentine zone, etc. cetera. Um, and the same goes for placement of stations. Um, you're required under the treaty to notify the treaty of what you're constructing and where you're going to place it. Uh, but there's no uh, regard given to someone saying, well, this is the Australian zone in this case. Uh, and we object. It's more 
the emphasis is on is this well placed? Will it be environmentally um, rigorous environmental controls in its in its establishment and maintenance? And what's the cooperation between? Um, I think the NR Treaty many differences between Antarctica and the Arctic you know, continent versus ocean, but um, but the treaty has uh, done extremely well in maintaining cooperation among countries. And uh, I think there's a little there has been a little buzz about recent Chinese research efforts. They've been on the rise. There's another station here, another there. Um, broadly, those of us who worked in Antarctic areas are always happy when there's new research and new funding for research. It's always cooperative. Interactions are good. Um, Kelly, maybe you want to speak a little bit to that, but that's my thought. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll just, just uh, echo what, what Ray said, but um, I sort of, I took short note of your question and said, there's, is there a problem with too much cooperation or something? Um, so maybe I'm misphrasing it, but uh, I think that um, since the claims are in abeyance while the treaty's in force, we certainly don't look at anybody owning anything in Antarctica, which uh, is a really good thing, but ob obviously at, from time to time it can be a challenging thing. Um, so, and I do think the status of science cooperation under the uh, treaty structure is quite healthy. Um, trying to see how that might give us some kind of lesson for the Arctic um, is hard, just for the reasons raised, because there are sovereign territories in the Arctic. Um, and I don't think there can be too much science cooperation in the Arctic either. Um, so in getting to the uh, indigenous participation, it's a very important uh, priority uh, in the interagency uh, context, but in, in NSF in particular, we're uh, committed to continuing efforts to make those kind of interactions more robust. I think we've gone through phases of trying to understand how to engage across communities and have evolved from original days where scientists showed up and told people what they were doing and that was good enough. Um, we really need it to be a two-way dialogue. We understand that. I personally participated in that two-way dialogue that Canada set up for its nation when I was working throughout the Canadian Arctic in, in my research and uh, learned a lot in the process adapted my science as a result of what I learned. So I feel like um, we are seeing progress there. It is, in fact, on the table for the binding agreement that we're talking about um, for the science cooperation. And then, John, uh, your question about the Belmont Forum, we won't know until the uh, competition closes but uh, in July, but uh, the, uh, the Russian funding agency has committed uh, dollars to fund people from Russia to participate in successful proposals. Um, and, and I'm very hopeful there. But everybody should understand that Russia is also undergoing, um, you know, interesting times for its scientists as it reorganizes the academy structure and puts a lot of emphasis on some of the more um, active universities and establishing new university practices and policies. I think they're trying to infuse rather than concentrate research in the academy and do education in universities. There's an effort to make things go more across uh, in order to, to up the ante and the, the game in science. And, you know, University of Arctic is playing an important role in, in that, um, in keeping everybody apprised of developments in that regard. So we'll see after July 31st whether things materialize, but I'm hopeful that they will. Uh, thanks, uh, Kelly, and and, uh, and and all of the the panelists. Uh, the, the last point about uh, bringing together uh, scientific research and training was something. One of my previous incarnations at the when I worked with the MacArthur Foundation, we were working with the Russian Ministry of Education and a number of uh, universities, and to to quite quite successfully um, back in the 1990s, and the, the program continued quite a long time be, beyond beyond that. Um, uh, I recall uh, that in our, our work uh, here at, at CSIS uh, on U.S. and Russian cooperation on health care, uh, we were, uh, Senator William Frist, uh, a board member at CSIS, was very actively involved with us, and he had a very good metaphor for it. He called it a, curren a currency of peace, and I think that the, that metaphor is uh, very much applicable to the, uh, the scientific and research cooperation that we've been talking about uh, this morning, uh, and that I think there was a clear uh, consensus uh, uh, that uh, uh, there, there cannot be too much 
uh, or we'd have to go an awfully long way for the for us to be in the position to be considering about whether there would be be too much. So uh, on that uh, positive note, uh, let me thank the uh, the panelists for uh, their brilliant uh, participations and thoughts and uh, coming to share them today with us this morning uh, and uh, turn the floor over to Heather, who I think has a very important announcement. Very important lunch time. Uh, but let me echo, thank you. That was a wonderful discussion, uh, great depth. So please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>